So we have two presentations today. Uh, first is going to be one of our chief residents who's joining the private practice world up in Ogden, Bryce Williams. Uh, we all know him really well. Hopefully we'll be seeing him again from time to time. So he's going to talk about interesting neuro patient. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, emphasis on the chief for sure. <laughs> After that roast, I don't know if I can catch up with Lloyd on the... <coughs> Uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Warner. I don't know if she's even here yet, but she caught me in the hallway and said, don't you have a neuro presentation left? I said, oh, I was hoping you'd forget about that. Uh, but she didn't, and we all know that she never forgets anything. <laughs> so here we are, <laughs> flashing gray spot. So this was a 37-year-old uh, female uh, right-handed that came in with a chief complaint of dimness in her left eye and uh, which became flashing lights in a gray spot. And the timeline was that on the 30th of April, she noted this grayness and she thought her contacts were dirty. Uh, the glasses didn't seem to help. <coughs> then the, a couple days later, uh, the, the gray spot began to flash and she noticed that it persisted with her eyes closed. She went in and saw, she was referred to a, ret a retina uh, specialist outside of the Moran and he said, quote, you need to see a neuro-ophthalmologist. And there was this uh, question of some c discomfort with eye movement, so there's possible optic neuritis. And, uh, and she noted some growth of the, the scotoma, that gray spot over the, over the week before she presented to us in the neur neuro-ophthalmology neuro clinic. Uh, her history uh, was significant for some depression and recurrent cold sores. She didn't have any uh, contributory surgical history. She had been put on amoxicillin a, a few weeks before for some flu-like symptoms, and she was finishing up that course. Uh, she w had been uh, placed on acyclovir, uh, naproxen, just for uh, some pain, just as needed, and a multivitamin. She was allergic to betadine. She had, a, obviously, refractive error, as I mentioned before. She had complained of some scalp itching for, like, 10 months, and kind of persisted and then lately several months this persistent nausea um, which was bothersome to her but she was still functional and and these flu-like symptoms that I mentioned on exam sh her vision was down in the left eye she was still 20 20 uh, missed a couple letters no APD the pressure was normal there was the color plates were normal there was no red desaturation confrontational visual fields were full Extractive movements, saccades, and pursuits were normal. Flicker fusion was normal. <coughs> and on exam, the anterior segment was normal. The posterior segment showed some punched out white lesions near the optic nerve head in the right eye, some rare vitreous cell in the right eye, uh, and, and one plus of its cell in the left eye, otherwise normal. And here I have a fundus photo of that, these punched out lesions, and, uh, and some pigmentation near the optic nerve head on both sides, actually. But otherwise, the fundus appeared fairly uh, normal. Visual fields did show uh, some defects in both eyes. There's good reliability. Uh, mean deviation was depressed in both eyes. Uh, the, you know, the gray pattern didn't show much in the right, but on pattern deviation, you saw start to see this kind of inferior scotoma. Um, the, right, the left eye was uh, very much a significantly enlarged blind spot, uh, which persisted in multifocal ERG. You see this area of depression here is the, the raw data, uh, this area of depression here in the left eye, and perhaps some also in the right eye here, which corresponded with the visual fields. This is a, a outside uh, angiogram, uh, which was fairly normal uh, early on you don't see any blockage or hyperfluorescence and same thing late on, later on you don't see any real hyperfluorescence of the optic nerve or any areas lighting up which was significant for the differential that we were thinking of so fairly normal fluorescein autofluorescence also did not show any obvious defects that uh, may correspond to the scotoma that she was uh, complaining of OCT uh, looks, you know, fairly normal. Again, no obvious uh, problems. The inner segment, outer segment junction seems fairly intact. Um, there may be something here, which I'll talk about later, that, 
they call this the outer segment of the uh, cones, the cone outer segment tips. So you can see it kind of falls off here. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So the differential uh, it includes more than this, but uh, these are kind of the big players. On the left, the enlarged blind spot syndrome uh, would be the top on the differential. Mudes would also be high and Azor. So those three I'm going to discuss in more detail. But less likely, you know, things to consider given her history of cold sores. Uh, herpetic disease can never be ruled out, as Dr. Mamos likes to remind us when we go to boards. Always talk about herpes, right? It's always there. <laughs> Ampi, although that didn't really, it didn't really look like Ampi. Uh, uh, punctate intercoroiditis, uh, multifocal choroiditis, and uh, panuveitis, and acute macular neuroretinopathy. But these classically will show that that, that um, autofluorescence defect that corresponds perfectly with the scotoma. <coughs> so I'll just uh, focus here on this acute idiopathic blind spot enlargement syndrome, which you know is kind of a mouthful, so they abbreviated AIBSE in the in the literature. It's been called big blind spot big blind spot syndrome in the past, uh, and there was a nice study done uh, back in 2001 of 27 cases where they used this flow chart to kind of identify people with AIBSE. You know, first you, f you identify a, a group of patients that have enlarged blind spots on visual field testing. If you don't have uh, optic disc swelling to explain the, the blind spot, they move down this path, this arm of the pathway. And then you look and see if there's anything in the retina that may explain it, uh, you know, multifocal choroiditis or PIC. And if there's nothing in the retina to explain it, then they identified these patients and diagnosed them with this AIBSE. And then they, they studied them. And, and here was some of their characteristics. Of the 27 patients, 25 complained of a loss of vision. Uh, of differ, you know, sometimes they explain it differently. Uh, but every, almost everybody had some sort of loss of vision. And almost everybody had some sort of positive visual phenomena you know, flashes, swirling, colored lights, after flash bulb kind of thing. So, uh, but photopsia is really the, the majority of their complaint uh, with the positive visual phenomena. If uh, on visual exam or on visual acuity testing, the majority of them were still 20-20. Some, you know, some had lost a little bit of vision, uh, but the, by and large, most everybody retains good vision with, with these uh, blind spot enlargement. Um, th interestingly enough, they detected a fair number of APDs. We didn't see that in our patients. And uh, the, the number of degrees of their scotoma uh, was, you know, ranged quite a bit. Here are some examples of the visual fields that they found in their study. Uh, you know, th these patients, these are 30-2s. They looked a lot like, like ours. They're different patients. Uh, they can show differently and uh, on Goldman. Uh, testing as well. So kind of fits with what our patient was looking like. Um, the one thing that, that our patient didn't have that they found most commonly was some uh, optic nerve head swelling. And uh, so on, if you go back to their flow chart, they say, well, you know, if there is enough optic nerve swelling to explain the blind spot, we're going to call it papilledema, you know, and, and attribute it to that. But if there wasn't quite enough to uh, explain all the visual field defects, then we'll call it this AIBSE. And, and here's some photos of what they didn't think was enough swelling to account for the visual field. So it's kind of a judgment call uh, on that. But a lot of their patients did have these punched out lesions, pigment changes. Uh, They're pointing out here this, this little gray line that maybe was, you know, uh, showed evidence of old edema. And on uh, fluorescein angiogram, they do see the, a late phase hot nerve, which our patient did not have. And even sometimes they'll see these little hyperfluorescent spots. And they still would call them this AIBSE instead of one of the white dot syndromes. Here's a study uh, that just came out that it was a case report more than anything. A patient that had complained of a, a blind spot 10 years prior he came back in with a new onset of symptoms. And so they imaged him again, and they found that in the eye that was symptomatic here, this left eye, that he had lost some of this, what they're calling the cone outer segment tip 
line, which I think if you look count these three heavy lines, I think it's the second line here is what they're talking about. See how it, it's lost here in this area compared to this side and you know the other side it has it nice and continuous the whole way. And he had on uh, nerve fiber layer, or no, this is retinal thickness that they use for the ETDRS map. He had had some thinning in that area, which corresponded to a scotoma. So they thought maybe long term these patients do lose some of their retinal physiology and, and anatomy, uh, which can be picked up on high definition OCT. And if you go back to our patient, that, you know there was a little bit of loss of that area. So it's, it's an interesting theory, but again, it's just a single case report and needs to be you know shown at more out in a case series. So as a summary, these are kind of how these patients do in general. If you want to, if you're more of a splitter, and you want to talk about AIBSE as a separate entity, you'll say, okay, there's more female, much, many more females than males. Uh, Photopsies and blind spot enlargement is the classic uh, symptoms uh, and, and uh, signs. There's usually no flu-like prodrome, which our patient did have this flu-like prodrome. Usually has some mild optic nerve head swelling and peripapillary pigment changes that resolve within two weeks. You know, we didn't really see that, and we, but we, and we did see her fairly uh, quickly after the onset of symptoms. Humphrey visual field and ERG, so areas of dysfunction that persist long after the symptoms resolve. So you can test them months and years after, and they still have the defects. However, their symptoms uh, go away. Full field ERG is normal, which we did not have in this patient, but we're going to obtain. And the fluorescein usually so shows some hyperfluorescence of the optic nerve head. Now contrast that with uh, the, it's uh, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome or MUDES typically does have a flu-like prodrome. Again, females more commonly than male. There is a mild vitritis, which our patient did have. It's usually unilateral, but there's some question of maybe if you talk to Dr. Vitali, who I hope is here, <laughs> he will tell you that he thinks it's usually bilateral, but much more uh, pronounced in one eye than the other. Uh, there's this granular retinal appearance with small white spots acutely, um, and the fluorescein angiogram will show hyperfluorescence in this wreath-like pattern with late staining of the optic nerve head and lesion. So there's a lot of overlap with what we've uh, discussed with AIBSE. ICG brings these changes out better than fluorescein, and so if you see patients in the future, order an ICG, and the Humphrey visual field changes will go away versus the, the blind spot. The other uh, big one on the differentials is Azor, acute zonal uh, occult outer retinopathy. <laughs> uh, again, females more than males, usually bilateral. You get the pro flu-like prodrome. Uh, the fundus will appear normal initially, and then late you get these pigmentation changes, and I'll show you a picture of that. The full-field ERG is uh, decreased, which is diagnostic um, in, in this setting to help distinguish it from the other entities. Humphrey field changes will correspond to the pigmentation and it's associated with autoimmune diseases, which is important uh, because uh, it can help distinguish between these. So here's a, an Azor patient. You see some uh, you know, vascular sheathing and some pigmentation changes. And uh, if, they, if they're uh, close enough to the, the macula, you'll see these changes on field, on the Humphrey visual field. And you can pick them up with uh, multifocal ERG changes. So the question is, are these all the same disease with just different types of expression based on the sensitivities of the patient and the immune response of that particular patient? And uh, you know, it kind of goes just what we were speaking about last week with the Epstein-Barr virus patient. You know, the, or, you know, is it just, are you a lumper or a splitter? Does it really matter anyway because most of these patients just get better on their own? There's no real treatment. Uh, you just, and uh, I think that's my next slide. So what we did with this patient was observed and, and reassured. We did do some lab workup, uh, which all came back fairly negative. Uh, th there was a question of maybe this was histo that had reactivated and just hadn't, you hadn't seen a new lesion, but you had those old punched out lesions, that was negative. Um, so the workup was negative, and uh, we're gonna follow her up with a repeat field and a multifocal ERG and a full field ERG, and, and maybe we'll have the rest of the story. Uh, an interesting patient, and uh, you know, it's something to keep in mind when you see these fields that come in with the big blind spots. 
uh, it'll help you, you know, give them a diagnosis and, and perhaps a prognosis, which is good. Dr. Antler. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's where I'm leaning. Just, yeah. Oh, Dr. Warner is here. I have my thank you card for you. Just. Yes. 